if you don't mind, I'm going to move around. As you heard, I spent 34 years in the Foreign Affairs Community, which is a secret talk for I was a CIA officer for most of my career, the Director of Operations. And so I teach my students here at IWP, never set patterns and never stand still, right? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, uh, something may land on your head if you don't want it to. So I hope I don't bother people by moving around, but I got to move. A uh, couple of warnings before I start the presentation tonight. First of all, I am not the master of making slides. My students can also, I have some of my students here, former students, they can confirm my slides are not always the best. I wanted to make some slides to talk about this subject tonight, which is, in my opinion, the most important national security issue that the United States has on its plate right now. And I'm going to try and explain to you why. And I welcome any uh, disagreements, questions, arguments. Uh, I, I do this talk around the country. I've been doing it for the last six months. And um, the issue of Russia and Ukraine right now is extremely important. So important that when there was a lecture last night, I understand, from one of my former colleagues, and I, I don't know, I wasn't here, unfortunately, I couldn't be here, but um, I'm, the second thing is I'm not going to go over the history of Russia and Ukraine. I'm going to hope that you know that history. If not, if you want to talk afterwards, we can talk. Uh, I'm not going to go delve into the history of the, of the countries, uh, the languages, the cultures, although those are very important to know. Uh, what I am going to say is, in my own opinion, you, you probably all know that Vladimir Putin, you guys heard that name? <laughs> Vladimir Putin? Uh, Vladimir Putin says that there is no, country, no such country as Ukraine, right? Vladimir Putin claims that Ukraine is just uh, the borderlands of the Russian Empire, and the Ukrainians don't exist, they are little Russians. Okay? And I'm going to say that I don't dis I disagree with that, and when I served in Moscow, uh, I made it clear to the Russians many times, I don't agree with that point of view. And thankfully, there are a lot of brave Ukrainians today that are fighting the Russians to prove to them that they also don't agree. And the third thing I want to say is I just came back from a trip to Kiev with uh, my former boss, General David Petraeus, and a group from the Cypher Brief where we had meetings with the senior level officials in the Ukrainian government. It's the second time we were there in uh, the last six months. And I want everyone in this room to understand what Ukrainians are going through right now, what they've been fighting it for, which is their independence and their sovereignty and their right to exist, uh, and how bravely they're fighting. But I also want everyone to understand in the room that we are now, the United States, in a very dangerous place. Ukraine is in a very dangerous place. And we are on the verge of losing a conflict with a dictator who is trying to force his will upon an entire nation. And if we in this country don't get our act together and get our act together fast, it's going to hurt the United States more than I think most Americans realize. And I, that's what I want to talk about tonight. I'm going to try and hit you with some slides and some statistics. Uh, English is not my first language. Statistics, how do you say that? Statistics? Thank you. Audience participation is welcome. Uh, that word that I got from our Chamber of Commerce uh, when I was in Kiev, they had a great fact sheet about things that the United States, the Americans need to understand about this war in Ukraine and our assistance to the Ukrainians. We all know that right now in Congress, uh, the aid bill for, for uh, Taiwan, Israel, and Ukraine is stuck. And we've been waiting for months for it to get approved. It is absolutely critical that that aid package get approved and that we rearm the Ukrainians to let them defend their country. Because if we don't, if we lose Ukraine, we are all going to suffer in this room. Absolutely. And our children are going to suffer, and I'm going to try and explain to you why. Okay? So, as I work through technology, this, let's start out with this. This is what we're looking at in Ukraine. So we all know that if you ask the Ukrainians, Ukrainians will say, I was, at a, uh, I was at an event earlier this week in Kansas, Kansas University, and General Breedlove, the former commander of NATO, said, you know, the Ukrainians have been fighting since 2014. The Ukrainian in the room right, said, sorry, we've been fighting for a minute. 400 years for our independence, not since 2014. Well, let's just say since 2014, when Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine and seized part of Ukraine and started his operation to undermine Ukrainian sovereignty, uh, this is what the Ukrainians have been dealing with on a regular basis. The war didn't start in 
uh, February 2022, it just got a lot worse for the Ukrainians. But the Ukrainians have been fighting a much larger and very dangerous opponent uh, since 2014. And I would posit to you that in 2014, when the United States failed to take a tough stance against what Russia did and to, and to make Putin pay a price for what he did, we set the stage for what happened in February 2022. If we don't take a tough stance now, this is my personal opinion, I should say this, I am a retired CIA officer, whatever I say is my opinion, it doesn't reflect the opinions of the US government or IWP, that's my disclaimer. But I would say that if we don't take a stand now, we're gonna see more aggression from Putin and people like Putin around the world. Okay, let's just talk some numbers here on the war that's being waged by the Russians the Russian regime against the Ukrainians. Uh, almost 130 documented war, war crimes committed since, just since February of 2022. 1,600 uh, plus military strikes against hospital, medical workers, ambulances. Uh, I think the number is 60% of all the Russian strikes against Ukraine, targets in Ukraine have been against civilian infrastructure. Not against military targets, civilian infrastructure. 80% uh, of the Ukrainian energy infrastructure has been destroyed or seriously damaged uh, in the last two years. Okay? Why do the Russians do that? Can anyone tell me why they're going after civilian targets? Psychological warfare. Psychological warfare. They're trying to terrorize the Ukrainians into submission. We as Americans should not allow that to happen, my personal opinion. That is called terrorism. All right? It's the same thing that happened on 7 October. When Hamas came across the border and killed innocent civilians in Israel, that's terrorism, all right? And by the way, if we don't realize, if people in this room don't realize that Iran and Russia are allies in a war that is, they, we're fighting a war, people. Americans don't want to hear this. They want to think that we're in some kind of negotiations or we can come up. We are at war, all right? We are at war with Russia. We are at war with Iran. We are at war with Hamas. We are at war with Lebanese Hezbollah. We may not want it, but they want it. They think they're at war. The Russians definitely think they're at war with the United States today. And it is all up to us to fight that war smartly. And right now, the smartest way to fight it is with an ally that is not asking anybody in this room to go fight for them. Uh-huh. They're not asking any of us to send our children. I have two sons. Last time we were in Ukraine, the Ukrainians told us, we get it. You guys were in Afghanistan, you were in Iraq, you lost people, you're tired of war. We're not asking for you to go again. We're not asking for your sons to go, your daughters to go. We're going. Our sons and daughters are going. One of the individuals I met with, six of his children were on the front as we were having a meeting. One of the parliamentarians we met with, she just came back from the front, she's a special operations officer in the Ukrainian military, came back from the front to have a meeting with our delegation and she was going back that night to the front. The Ukrainians were fighting this war. And so far they've been extremely effective in fighting the war and standing up to the Russians and making the Russians pay a price for what the Russians did. Unfortunately, the, the Ukrainians now are running out of ammunition, okay? And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be in combat without ammunition facing an enemy, which the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense told us that in uh, that the North Koreans, by the way, another country we're probably at war with, the government of North Korea has provided the Russians with 10 million rounds of 155 millimeter howitzer ammunition. Okay? 10 million rounds. And the Ukrainians are running out of ammunition. And we, in this country, are letting that happen right now. Shame on us. I hate to say it. About 3,500 schools and, and institutes of higher education have been bombed, and 1,000 kindergartens, kindergartens people. All right? Refugees, 6.5 million Ukrainian citizens are officially reported to be living outside of Ukraine today, and almost 4 million dis displaced persons inside of Ukraine. They can't live where they, where they want to live because of the war. For United Nations estimates 40% of the Ukrainian population is in need of humanitarian assistance as of today. 14.6 million people. Kidnapping and forced adoptions. Estimates that we were given between 1.3 to 4.7 million Ukrainian citizens have been forcibly deported to Russia. That's called kidnapping. 
all right? 20,000 children have been kidnapped and brought to Russia. We as Americans, I don't think anybody in this room supports kidnapping, right? I hope nobody in our Congress or in the White House supports the idea of kidnapping. That is what the Russian regime is doing to the Ukrainian people, okay? Since 2014, approximately one and a half million children have been deported to Russia. And 400 registered cases of uh, forced adoptions of Russian children. It's kidnapping. 8,000 missile strikes against civilian targets. 4,000 UAV strikes against civilian targets. By the way, who do you think are providing those missiles and UAVs? Any idea? Iran. Iran. Who? North Korea. Iran. China. Iran. North Korea. China. They're not stopping. They're, they're not having a debate in their... Right, well, they have parliament. Okay? No mention least in Iran, they're not debating it. They're sending the UAVs. Every night we were in, in Kiev, the city was hit by an Iranian drone strike. Okay? 60% of all of the strikes have been against civilian infrastructure targets. Over 30,000 civilian casualties reported by the Ukrainian authorities and the United Nations. Over 10,000 killed, almost 20,000 injured, 587 children killed or injured by Russian strikes. Okay? That is the war that the Russians are waging on the Ukrainian people. Okay, in 2014, there, Ukraine had about 7% of its uh, territory occupied by the Russians. If you guys remember when they rolled into Crimea and they rolled into the Donbass, into the east. Uh, March 22, they grabbed another 20%. Uh, and after the Ukrainian counteroffensive, the Ukrainians brought it down to about 18%. Now, great job by the Ukrainians. But guess what? The Ukrainians told us that the Russians are amassing another offensive against the Ukrainian forces that they expect to happen this summer. Between 150,000 and 300,000 Russian troops are being armed and equipped to start another offensive. <coughs> we in this room, we in this country, do not want one more inch of Ukrainian territory to be taken by the Russians. We should not. Okay? That's called theft. And that's what they're doing. Damaged infrastructure. 30% uh, of Ukrainians' infrastructure has been damaged or destroyed. Estimates are about uh, 270 billion U.S. dollars to rebuild Ukraine, and that infrastructure has been lost. As of April 24, 80% of the strikes on energy infrastructure. The Russians have aggressively targeted thermal power generation plants, nuclear power plants, and transmission lines. Nuclear power plants. Let's think of the environmental disaster. We care about the environment here. It's a big issue in the United States, right? What happens when they bomb a nuclear power plant? Okay? Uh, where world, do you think Chernobyl is? What's that? And where do you think Chernobyl is? Where do you think Chernobyl is? World Bank estimates it will cost 452 billion US dollars to build Ukraine at the end of all this. Okay? I'm not going to go through all the stats on the on the Ukrainian agricultural sector, but I think we all know in this room Ukraine was known as the breadbasket of Europe. A couple of things we have to remember. We start to see this in 2022 when the Russians shut down the lines of communication in the Black Sea. And the Ukrainians couldn't ship their agriculture out of the country. Uh, the Ukrainian agricultural sector was a huge provider of grain, uh, wheat, other agricultural products for the world economy. The Ukrainians were feeding a lot of people. And if you guys remember, when, they, when the Russians shut down those lines of communication, there was major concern that in Africa and parts of uh, the Middle East there was going to be mass starvation because the Ukrainians couldn't ship stuff to their customers. Okay? It damaged the Ukrainian economy, which is what the Russians wanted, but it also hurt a lot of other people. Now, the good news is the Ukrainians have been very, very effective at chasing the Russians out of the Black Sea port of Sevastopol. They've opened up some of those lines of communication along the western coast of the Black Sea. They are now beginning to ship some of their grain products again. But guess what? They can't do that if we don't rearm them. And the Russians are going to come back if we allow them to come back and shut down the, the sea lanes of communication. And that is going to be a problem for the entire world, not just for Ukraine. It's going to be a big problem for this country. Okay? So 50% of the global supply of sunflower meal and oil, sunflower oil, 20% of rapeseed and barley, ranked the fourth leading exporter of corn in the world. That's important to me because my last name is corn. 
get so serious here. I gotta see. Uh, by the way, we don't get a percentage of my family for all that porn extra. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it should be clear to us that we do not want the Ukrainian agriculture sector to be shut down. And I would argue we have a moral responsibility to help the Ukrainians, but we also have a financial uh, interest in helping the Ukrainians. Okay? 200 tons of Ukrainian wheat was destroyed in port by Russian strikes and by their closing down the shipping, so the, the wheat just rotted. It was no longer usable. Uh, export to African and Asian countries was cut by 3 million tons. And as of April 24, approximately 30% of Ukrainian territory is mined as a result of the war. So a country about the size of Austria cannot be used by the Ukrainians or by the world to produce food because of what the Russians are doing. And it's estimated it'll take 30 to 70 years to demine uh, and cleanse the land. It's not just mines, but it's all kinds of ordnance that's out there. I should have said this before. If anyone has any questions, I know, please ask. Um, I'm sorry to say that. Okay, what is at stake in Ukraine? Ukraine is the largest European country after Russia with a pre-war population of over 40 million people. Citizens. Home of over 20 critical, please pay attention to this. Any people here in the business community? Please pay attention to this. Economists, 20% of critical raw materials, including lithium, cobalt, graphite, and zirconium. It is in the United States' best interest that we have access to that, and that we don't allow the Russians to seize it, and to control it, and to dictate who has access to it. We need it. Estimated value of these deposits, $3 trillion to $11.5 trillion U.S. dollars. Ukrainian exports feed more than 400 million people in the world today. Okay? Energy resources, second largest deposits of natural gas reserves in Europe. Did, did we know that? Did anybody know that? That's right. Like, like who must be like the gas expert? <laughs> or, not just the Ukrainian. Okay, so do we want the Russians to control that? No. No. We're not doing enough to secure our interests. Thank you, Uh And this is not a ringer. <laughs> I didn't ask for this. I swear. Well, I would have if I had known. <laughs> okay, gas extraction volume reached 18, 19 billion cubic uh, meters, continues to control 90%, so the Ukrainians as of today control 90% of their oil and gas, uh, the Russians control the other 10%, and Ukraine is among the top 10 countries with proven strategic reserves of titanium and 7% of the uh, world production. And it has a, one third of Europe's lithium. Isn't lithium important to us today? Isn't it a critical resource? Aren't people yeah. scrambling all over the world to get lithium? Yeah. We have an ally that has it, and yet we are risking losing it because we can't get our act together. And so is Europe, by the way. And so is Europe. There are so many things that Europe, by dithering and shifting from one foot to the other and back and forth, which is historically a very weak European nation. Uh, all I want to say is I was born here in New York. I'm an American. Yeah. I'll let the, the Europeans work their stuff out. I'm talking to an American audience. Okay? Right. I get it. The Europeans could do more. And we're going to get to some stats here, too, to correct some of the fallacy that the Europeans are doing nothing, because they are doing quite a bit. Yeah. And I will tell you this. What the Ukrainians told us when we were in Kiev this last time was, thankfully, the Europeans have stepped up in many ways, while we're still stuck here in our political mm. melees, or whatever the word would be, gridlock. And, and they're helping them right now hold the line. But I think we all know that, you, that the Europeans cannot do that long term without U.S. leadership. And I would also posit to you, any Europeans in the room here? Please don't throw anything at me. But as an American, my interest is to make sure that U.S. companies have access to this market in the future. Okay? If we don't do what we're supposed to do as Americans, Sure, maybe the Europeans will have it, but that doesn't mean that we're going to have jobs for Americans. It doesn't mean that the investment's going to be back in the U.S. economy. So my opinion is the U.S. needs to step up. With our European partners, yes. But to your point about the Europeans, all I can say again is I'm American. I'm speaking as an American. And I want as an American to do the right thing. My parents raised me to do the right thing. My parents raised me, by the way, anybody ever here been in a bar fight? Come on. 
I know you were. <laughs> you had a bar fight with your buddy. Steve and I go in a bar and we get jumped by six people. If I turn around and run and leave Steve to get pummeled, is that the right thing? No. It's dishonorable. It's dishonorable. We are leaving someone to get pummeled right now. Okay, stolen assets. As of uh, April 24, Russia seized 12.7 trillion U.S. dollars in Ukrainian energy deposits. Russians control 63% of Ukrainian coal. Okay, coal deposits. 11% of oil, 20% of Ukrainian natural gas, 43% of uh, metal deposits, and 22% of the rare earth minerals, including lithium. Technology. Ukrainians are very proud of what they've done on the technological front. They are becoming an IT capital of the, not just Europe, of the world. Okay? They're producing some incredible, uh, well, they, there are just a lot of really smart, proficient, technically proficient people in Ukraine. We want them on our side, folks. Some of the stuff, if you look what they're doing in, in drone technology and warfare, has been incredible on their own. I would posit to you that we want them on our side when this whole thing is done. We don't want them on the other side because that's going to be a big problem for the United States. Okay? Sources of aid. Here goes, go back to the, to the Europe, U.S. issue. There is a false sense in the United States the Europeans are doing nothing. Okay? Total of about 100 billion U.S. Dollar, US dollars in aid provided by the international community, 44 billion by the U.S. 90% of U.S. security assistance is spent. By the way, 90% is spent back here in the U.S. economy. I was out in Texas giving this talk, and someone said, I'm tired of paying for other people. I said, you know what? Your cousin is probably working in a defense plant on a line that's producing Stinger missiles for the Ukrainians. And but guess what? Before February 22, that line was shut down. And the Pentagon, the U.S. government, had to reopen it. All over the country, there are jobs being created by our aid to Ukraine. And we are rebuilding the defense industrial base, which we allowed to atrophy to a dangerous point before all this harp this happened. Since February 22, the monthly output of the U.S. defense sector has reached its highest level since World War II. Not Vietnam, not Iraq, not Afghanistan. 117 defense production lines in 21 states, 71 cities are making weapons and equipment to support the Ukrainian military needs and our NATO partners. We all realized that when the war started, it jolted the rest of NATO awake, and they realized we better start arming ourselves. Many of our NATO partners, by the way, have forward deployed their equipment to the Ukrainians, and they're buying, replacing that with U.S.-made weapons. Okay? So I don't want to be accused of being like the warmonger or the representative of the defense industrial complex. I went to college two months. I remember, you know, oh, that's evil defense industrial complex. But the reality is, is that this is industry in the United States. This is technology. This is jobs. This is taxes back into the economy. Investment in Ukraine is not wasted money. It's not a handout. We're helping. If it's a handout, it's a handout to America. Okay? Benefits to the U.S. Aid to Ukraine has provided $3.3 billion in direct industrial investment in the U.S. economy. It's estimated to have created 100,000 new jobs, uh, mainly in the defense industry. Uh, let's see, and what, 100,000 to 2 million jobs between February and uh, 22 and the present. And key states that are benefiting from this defense dividend are Arizona, Florida, Arkansas, and Texas. In Alabama, the defense sector accounts for uh, 250,000 jobs with an annual payroll of almost uh, $20 billion. Anyone here from Alabama? Okay, defense sales. One of the things that this war demonstrated to the world is one, Russian defense uh, production is not quality. Okay? And countries need to defend themselves. Since the war began, and since some of our weapon systems have been deployed on the battlefield, as one of the Ukrainians called this in their parliament, this is like a free marketing program from the U.S. defense sector. We are, we are deploying and using your weapon systems on the battlefield, and it's getting a lot of advertising, and now we have other countries buying. So there's a couple of examples here. You know, uh, 
Defense sales for the U.S. have increased significantly due to the demonstration of U.S. systems on the Ukrainian battlefield. Since 2022, the U.K., Norway, and Alabama, Alabama, no, Albania, Latvia, Bulgaria, and Thailand have all contracted to purchase the Javelin anti-armor vehicle system. Remember the Javelin at the beginning of the war? Okay, take a step back. In September, when we were in uh, Ukraine, we met with the commander of uh, Ukrainian um, naval infantry forces. And he told us, he said, you know, in the beginning of the war, we were outnumbered and outgunned. And I thought my troops, the first couple of days when the Russians invaded or expanded their invasion, I was worried about my troops. And then we got the first javelin. And he said that my guys could have done, we, I was worried they were going to want to march on Moscow. Mm -hmm. They were so motivated. And every time we'd get a new shipment of American equipment, the motivation level of our troops was so high. It was, the, it was a huge uh, difference in the morale of my people. That was a good news story, but guess what? This last time we were there, we're beginning to see the troops saying, we don't want to fight. People, conscripts are saying, we don't want to go to the front because we don't have any weapons, okay? We don't have like, we're gonna be handed a rifle with no ammunition. Artillery rounds are depleted. And the Russians are pounding us every day and we have nothing to defend ourselves with. I don't think anyone in this room would want to go fight in those circumstances, and we shouldn't ask the Ukrainians to do that either. My opinion. Yes, ma'am. What this has also done, it's demonstrated to the world the U.S. military capacity, and this is important for regarding China and other regions. And it's also shown the weakness of the other military materials that Russia has been utilizing, not just because they had to reach back in mothball stuff, but um, things coming from North Korea, things coming from Iran, things coming from China, even. Yes. Um, and so these whole, it's a dynamic that shows one side high and the other side low. That is true, and that's an excellent point, but I got bad news for you. Yes. What the Ukrainians have told us, and what we've seen is the Russians have made up major territory. They are fixing the problems. I just wrote an article about this because I spent a lot of time working in Russia. What I saw with the Russians is they make a mistake one time and then they fix it. The Ukrainians are saying on the battlefield, the Russians have improved massively. On the intelligence front, the Russians have improved massively. And the technology front, they're catching up to the Ukrainians very quickly. So we can't sit on our laurels and think because in 2020, 22, the Javelin was super successful or the famous Turkish Bayraktar was super successful. Guess, guess what? You ever hear about the Bayraktars now? No, because the Russians have figured out how to defeat it with electronic warfare. And they're deploying electronic warfare systems that the Ukrainians don't have. The Ukrainians are saying, help us. And right now we're saying, oh, we can't. We're going on Easter recess. No, we're having an internal fight for the Republican Party and abandoning our principles. We, we are having, a, I'm not going to say Republican Party, Democratic Party. We are having an internal fight in the U.S. government, in this nation, and we are, I would agree with you. We are, some people are abandoning our principles. Shame on us. Exactly. Following the provision of the M1 Fort HIMAR system to Ukraine, the manufacturer of the system received additional orders from other countries of, uh, equaling about 200 billion US dollars. 486 new systems. Orders for Abrams tanks have reached 9.5 billion. That's jobs here in the United States. Okay. I hope. You see why I think it's in our best interest to keep investing in this righteous war of self-defense by a country that needs to defend itself. But I want to talk about a couple other things, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. Americans need to think three-dimensional here. If we fail in supporting the Ukrainians, if Ukraine loses this war, and if Vladimir Putin gets away with his land grab, we need to remember the following. Our allies are going to turn away from us. Countries that we rely on. Countries that are currently watching from the sidelines trying to figure out who do we hitch our horse to? Who do we ally ourselves with? A year ago, we're moving close to Washington saying, okay, the tyrant's going to be defeated. We can trust the Americans to protect us. They're moving away from us. They're walking away. My partner and I were on a phone call the other day with somebody from a Central Asian country. He said, a year ago as an American businessman, I could walk into any ministry here and get a meeting like that. Now I, people aren't answering the phone because they're afraid. I worked in Central Asia. 
They're afraid that the United States is going to show weakness and Putin is going to be there to threaten them and no one's going to be there to help them. Okay? You got to think about that because in my career in the Central Intelligence Agency, I'm very proud of the fact that I was part of the team after 9-11 that we did great work around the world protecting this country from terrorist threats. We stopped a lot of attacks on the homeland and against Americans all over the world. Many late nights, weekends spent running CT operations to make that happen. But guess what? We needed partners to do that. In almost every case that I can think of, we had to have local partners and help us. If we can't turn to partners in the future and say we need to disrupt the threat, bombs are going to go off in this country. Mm -hmm. I don't want that to happen, but we need to think about it. If we can't turn to country X and say, we need you to arrest this group, or we need you to take down this network, if they think, well, the Americans, are, uh, that, this is going to piss off the Chinese, and the Americans aren't going to be with us when they get, oh, well, sorry, not going to do it, that's going to be a problem for this country. This is like second and third order effects. Uh, we need to think about the following. Right now, so the Ukrainians told us there are about 100 about a million troops that have been in combat. Some of them two years or more on the front. Eventually they're gonna to have to come home. On the Russian side, we don't even know the number. We know the Russians have probably lost between 300 to 400,000 casualties. The total number of Russians that have been at war, we don't know, but we do know that there are estimates that Putin opened the jails and conscripted or enlisted over 100,000 criminals, including rapists and murderers to go fight in Ukraine. They're going back to Russia. Let's say that the war stops tomorrow. We're going to have all those people go back to their societies, which are ill-equipped. I can speak for Russia, absolutely ill-equipped to deal with issues like PTSD, okay, psychological trauma from what they've been exposed to. Let's look at these young Ukrainians that have been now exposed to their parents being killed, how you know, schools being bombed while they were in them. We need to think about what is this going to mean for the world a societal crisis in Eurasia. In places where, I hate to say it, but there are a lot of weapons on the battlefield. Okay? A lot. And again, part of my career was spent chasing down stingers that were all over the place. After 9-11, we spent a lot of time, actually before 9-11, trying to get those things back. We're going to have to think about that. If we can't count on partners to help us do that, and the most important right now partner of the Ukrainians, we're in big trouble. Okay, we're all in big trouble. Let's, you know, we can put aside that Russia's going to invade, you know, I don't think they're going to invade Alaska tomorrow. They probably will make a land grab for the Baltics, Poland. But we just need to think about these other impacts. Organized crime, narcotics trafficking, weapons trafficking, counterproliferation. Okay? We need partners, we need allies to work with us to stop all this stuff. And if we don't stand for the Ukrainians right now, we can't count on that. I don't think so. Uh, so here, look at the number of veterans going home. You guys remember, okay, those of you that, those of us that were exposed to Afghanistan and Iraq, we have a lot of people that are struggling now with PTSD, right? It's a tragedy. Times that by a hundred. For Russia. Time, I was in Russia in the early 90s when Russia collapsed, and there had a big problem with Afghan war veterans involved in criminal activity. Times that by a thousand, and that's what we're going to be dealing with. So let's think about it. Okay? Violent crimes today in Russia are already on the rise. By the way, it is a bit ironic to me that Vladimir Putin came to power in 1999 by promising the Russian people stability and order and respect. And now he's completely undermining that, as events in Moscow recently showed. How many, how many Russians died in that terrorist attack? 146. Right? That is because Putin is so busy fighting a, a senseless war to try and project his ego on the Ukrainian people, and he's denying himself the ability to have cooperation, which, by the way, when he did, was he willing to cooperate with us a little bit? We were able to help him stop people from dying on the streets of St. Petersburg Road. Now he's not getting that, because he won't talk to us, because he's got to wage the senseless war. 
This is my last slide, and then I'm going to open up to questions, comments. But I just want to say it. Yes, you've heard it before. I'm going to say it again. A victory for Putin will be a victory for Xi Jinping. It'll be a victory for the uh, Mullah regime in Iran, okay, which is already showing its aggressive behavior. All right? It'll be aggressive. It'll be, by the way, folks, Nicaragua. Venezuela. We talk about the southern border a lot. That's an important issue. But our western hemisphere, we have these dictators, these mini Putins in our backyard. And if you think that they're going to like not be emboldened by what is happening in a Putin victory, we're sadly mistaken. The best way to deal with them is to win in Ukraine. And by the way, pay more attention to the western hemisphere, Latin America. <laughs> which we should do. By the way, as Americans, we should be able to chew gum and walk at the same time. We did fight a second world war, a world war where we fought in Africa, North Africa, Europe, and Asia, successfully and armed the world. We were the arsenal of democracy. So I don't understand when Americans say today, well, we can't help Israel and we can't help Ukraine at the same time. Really? We can't? My parents raised five sons. My mother raised them. My father was always down working, but my mother raised five sons. They were all a little bit off, you know, but you get my point. We can do it. Uh, ironically, I, I do believe this very much. A, a, a victory for the Ukrainians will be the answer to making Russia a, a more stable. We're never going to be friends with Russia. That's my conclusion, having studied Russia for many, many years. But we could have a better relationship or a more stable relationship where Russia isn't threatening its neighbors all the time and us in our national security interests. We could get there. But to do that, the Ukrainians have to win. My opinion. I'm happy to discuss that. People want to talk about that. Staying with Ukraine will improve the U.S. image abroad, which, by the way, if you don't realize, <laughs> is not so great right now. Okay? We have an opportunity. In, in February 22, Putin finally made a strategic mistake, and he gave us an opportunity to exploit it. And we're not doing it. And it's not one party. It's as a, as a government as a whole, we failed. We're failing. We cannot fail. And the last thing I say is, yes, I personally believe, and I hope people in this room believe, that helping the Ukrainians now to defend themselves is the right thing to do. This, I'll, I'll conclude with this. If you guys go up to the stairway here, this poster is on the wall. The first time I came to IWP when I was retiring from the Navy, I was asked to come meet with Dr. Winchowski, who's a great American. And he wanted to talk to me about teaching here. When I saw that poster, it was like inspiring to me. And I've been thinking about it every day since. Because Americans, you can't read the whole thing, so it's my slide, but Americans will always fight for liberty. That's what the Ukrainians are fighting for right now. And again, they're not asking any of you to go. They're not asking any of you to send your children, your relatives. They didn't ask for one American to go fight. What they're asking for is that material support, the weapons, some financial support, and the moral support to continue their fight to protect their country and to take back the land that was stolen from them. And it is in our best interest, economically, financially, diplomatically, national security-wise, to do it. My personal opinion. Now, I'm going to be quiet. We have some questions. I need an easy question. Yes, sir. So, thanks. Two quick questions. One is um, in the Washington Post today. I'm sure you may have seen this article that talks about how um, the administration is warning Ukraine not to attack um, oil refineries and infrastructure in Russia related to energy. They're worried about gas prices in Europe going up, losing allies in this fight because of that. Um, and then on top of that, of course, Ukraine doesn't want to do that at all. Um, and then the issue with Congress being unresolved. Um, and all this worry that um, this could escalate into a nuclear situation with a superpower. Where, where is the pathway to, to help from the US side with these obstacles? Okay, so first on the on the striking of energy infrastructure inside of Russia, this is the this is the, what the Ukrainians will tell you. The reason we're doing that is because the Russians are bombing us nonstop. And we have no system now, we have no air, we're running out of air defense. Okay, Patriot missile batteries, we're running out of resupply, we're running out of whatever air defense we had. We have no air force. We have no top cover to protect our troops on the front. 
The best thing we can do is to go after the oil and gas infrastructure which is being used to fuel the aviation for the, for the Russian Air Force, the Ru Ru Russian Aviation Forces. And it's working. It's having some impact. So one, what the Ukraine has told us was, thank you, Washington, but we're not going to listen to your request because we're fighting a war for survival. And two, I would suggest that if we can resupply them, then they may not have to go do what they're doing. If we care about gas prices in Europe, we get gas prices here at the pump in the United States. Let's get them what they need so they have an alternative option to doing what they're doing right now. And by the way, when we were in Kiev, the Ukrainians struck a target in Kazan. Okay, Kazan and Tatarstan. That was pretty impressive. And they, I asked them, I said, can you do, I, I said, can you just strike a target in Iran? And they said, well, you'll see something in Siberia soon. So I don't think they're going to stop. And they have a legitimate reason for going after those targets. 80% of the Ukrainian infrastructure has been destroyed. How about we ask the Russians why they're doing that, instead of telling the Ukrainians not to do what they need to do to protect themselves. Your second question, my own assessment is, uh, somebody said this recently, another conference says that, I agree a thousand percent, the Russians and our other enemies, the, the Iranians, are deterring us, we're not deterring them. If you look at Soviet military doctrine, they don't talk about using nuclear weapons in a war. They use it about strategic deterrence. They are, they are threatening us with the threat of use of nuclear weapons to get us not to do things. I would suggest that you know Putin has drawn red lines multiple times. If you go in and help the Ukrainians, I'm going to use a tactical nuke. I'm going to do this. I'm going to invade Europe. I'm going to take out Paris. Whatever. We've done. We've crossed that red line multiple times, and he has not done it. I personally do not believe that Putin, or especially the people around him, will let him do that. Because they know the consequences for Russia are much worse than they are for the United States or for Europe. And I'll tell you this, if the Russians think that they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the U.S. military, and I know they don't, they know realistically they cannot. The U.S. military will destroy the Russian military pretty quickly. Well, what if you have China in that equation? If China, that's a whole different question. But if we don't do something now in Russia, we're going to have to deal with that later. And by the way, you know who's going to control the lithium and the oil and gas and the agricultural products? Not just in Ukraine, but in Russia. And this is the irony of it too. Putin is selling Russia to China, and we are giving them that whole market if we lose. I can tell you, when I was in Russia, most Russians don't want that. They don't want to be aligned with China. They don't want to have to answer to China. They'd much rather have some kind of relationship with the West. So, you have a good question. But the best way to stop it is to show some resilience now. Some resolve now. My personal opinion. Uh, <laughs> I think it would be, oh, sorry. So, uh, as an intelligence analyst, I, I think you can recognize that uh, had, had, had Donald Trump early on said something about this in a very strong way, things would be much different. It seems as if the Russians are holding on until he gets reelected. And he says on the first day, things are gonna change. I mean, he had some difficulty when he first took over, I mean, because he wasn't able to change the ambassador and the National Security Council and the whole bureaucracy was against him, but now he knows better. So once he, once he gets in and things change, what do you think his motivation is as an intelligence analyst and what will happen? First, I have to say I wasn't an analyst, I was an operator. So the, so the, so the analysts would say I'm a knuckle dragger, but, but I do do, I, I, I'm being facetious, every intelligence officer should be an analyst, right? And so here's what I think. I think, uh, first of all, Donald Trump, when he was the president, I have never seen in my career a tougher line on Russia than what I saw with that administration. That administration did quite a bit to punish the Russians when Russians stepped out of line. I will just refer you to events in Syria in 2017 when 300 Wagner troops were killed by the U.S. military when they when they did not heed the warnings. Three, three times they were warned not to push on an American position. And when they didn't, the third time they made the mistake, 300 Russians were dead, sadly, because their leadership tried to poke us. That was under the Trump administration. Okay? Uh, I personally think that Who's ever in the White House, what we need to do is show resolve. Show the Russians we are not going to be pushed any further. And again, the Ukrainians have given us an amazing opportunity. 
by their willingness to fight and stand up to the Russians. To show them, like, this is where the line is going to be drawn. Okay? I don't, I'm not going to comment on, like, domestic U.S. politics. My personal opinion is we've been too hesitant to give the Ukrainians a lot of essential support we need them. We've been giving out bits and drafts. And Putin has been threatening us and blackmailing us, and we've been falling for it. I personally think we need to call this bluff. And whoever, whatever president does it, let's do it. Ronald Reagan, I'm sorry, but I got to say this. Ronald Reagan was the president who said, if I don't have the courage as the leader of the free world, as the leader of the strongest country in the world to stand up to the Soviets, to the communists, when they threaten me with their nuclear weapons, how do I expect the people of the Soviet Union, who I know are good people, to stand up to their dictatorship? Different Not, times now. It, it may be different times, but that's the spirit we need, in my opinion. We need to show the moral courage. I and yes, is there a risk? Be a realist. You know it's coming down. You, you read the newspapers. Trump says on the first day it will change. Yeah, but what does that mean? And exactly. we don't know. And he so, made some statements about solving it in 24 hours, which is totally impossible. What it means is going to play off the nationalist message and the isolationist message he's been putting out there. He's going to say we should be spending the money at home, we shouldn't be spending it over there. And <laughs> Honestly, I don't think so. I think when Donald, when Donald Trump sees what's at stake, the money that's at stake, he'll get involved. And I also don't think that Donald Trump wants to be the president that loses Ukraine. Okay? And he shouldn't be. No win. president should be. He's going to market it as a win. He's, he's, he's not going to get elected. All right, let's, let's, uh, if you want to talk about U.S. politics, we can do that later in a bar. Okay? <laughs> so you made a good case uh, about this cause, and I agree with them. You know, are you talking about Americans fighting for liberty, or are you talking about Americans sending arms to people to fight for liberty? What's that? Which would you rather do? I'm advocating, well, first of all, I personally say if we had to, we should fight for liberty. Okay. Okay? And I'm, so we're not being asked to do that right now. So we're being given an easy option, and we're even failing there, which is, again, shame on us. That's so, important. I have a non-political question. Yes. What, no, what, what lessons do you think Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping will, what lessons um, do you think uh, Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un will learn from this Ukrainian war? So you mean like tactically, like what are their militaries learning, or? Yeah, strategically. Strategically, yeah. I think that if, if they, okay, they think the United States is weak and we don't have the resilience, we don't have the commitment to stand up for an ally, then all the allies that we have in their on their borders need to be yours. Because I think it's going to mean that they think, okay, we can push and the Americans are not going to push back. And whether we like it or not, that's the world we live in today. A lot of those countries, I know a lot of people say, like, I'm tired of being on the world's policeman. And I get it. I'm a little bit tired of it. I did it for 34 years. But you know what? If we lose those countries, it hurts us. Time to grow up, America. We can't be isolationists. We don't live on an island anymore. All right? And those leaders, they're they're watching. Putin's telling them all the time, Americans are weak. Americans have no reason, they have no resolve. They're not tough. All right? I went to school in New York Public School. We're tough. We can be tough. Let's get tough. Sorry. Yes, Pam. Okay. I too spent more than 34 years in the foreign policy community, and I also started with the agency that you spent a lot of time with. But I, I, I got out because I had promised myself in 1964 when I saw the imbalance in the way, what the country, way the country was going. Politically, I said, I will leave my job and work full time to elect the next republic of the United States. Then I went back into government service. So I've combined my life dedicating to liberty and free markets. What Thank concerns you. me now. I don't think anybody's in this room and say don't already believe your talking points. We're getting more, more strength out of the specifics. But we have a problem on both sides, and I'm not going to use this catney phrase, the eye. We have a problem in both parties that's, that claim to represent huge swaths of the American population. Because one is scared to death of doing anything to offend a left fringe, and the other is paralyzed by a right-wing group that takes courage from some of Donald Trump's rhetoric and says, today in Congress, we can't fund any of this stuff until we get the border secured. Well, it might not matter how many bad guys you keep out, although we have to keep them out, if you let this go. So what I see is, I see 
1938 situation. It scares me half to death, but I also see within this country an 1850s situation where we don't know who stands for what within the political spectrum in the United States. And having spent all my life working for this, I happen to be 83 in two days, it frightens me to death. What I don't understand and what I wanted to get out of this seminar, which we haven't heard yet, is this is what people have to know. The real problem is the politics in the United States. And how does anybody put this before enough people on either side of what party they think they might belong to? Or if they're pretty silly and think parties don't stand for anything, they think they're in an independent, which that means you don't believe anything. But the point is, how do we get a message across? Because that your message is to a room of no more than 50 people. Right. Uh, I don't know how we get a message across, and if we, and I'm afraid that solving Ukraine in 24 hours might mean saying, okay, you can keep our heads, but you've got the rest. And that is not an answer for me. Right. So, first of all, thank you for your service. Thank you for your comments. I agree with you. I keep saying this, like, a lot of us in the national security space keep having this discussion, and we're all talking to ourselves. We all more or less agree. Yes. Right? And it's, I, you know, we've said, like, we got to get out to middle America. we got to get out to these people, like in Georgia, where there are certain members of Congress that are saying, like, Putin is right. Okay, they're eating up the RT or the Sputnik propaganda. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I don't know. All I can tell you is my commitment when I retired was I wanted to teach. We have a, the biggest national security challenge in our country today is our broken system of education. My, and guess what? And that was a communist objective from the 1940s. It, it, man, it, uh, whosoever objected this, they achieved it. They did. Okay? And that's why I wanted to teach, and that's why I do this. That's why I do go speak at other places. Uh, that's why I'm happy to teach here. It was an honor when Dr. Lanchowski asked me to come teach here, because this is one place where I think it's focused on education and, and knowledge and not a lot of other stuff. You know, I was at, we were at the... Uh, seminar in uh, California recently, and one of the deans here put out, I know the statistic is true, that Harvard, for every one bachelor degree student, they have 1.2 1. 1. administrators, or 1.5 administrators. What does that mean? I mean, 1.5? First of all, what's the 0. 0.5? But, 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 I mean, we, we have a problem in this country, and so to me, it's education. And I'm just doing my bit, and I'm asking all of you to go do your bit. Go talk to people. That's one of the things that the Chamber of Commerce, when they came up with these numbers, they said to us, you know, one of the things we saw with some of the congressional delegations coming is, if you tell them it's the right thing, we got to just go. But if you tell them there's money involved, whoa, we have the lithium? Did you just say lithium? That's important. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce? That's the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. You presented it to us. No, they presented this, some of these numbers to us. That was So I get your point. But we just got to try. I will not give up this country. And none of us in this room should. Bravo. Bravo. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Um, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this. And you have organized it very well. And uh, I'm too in an education. Uh, and I'm the associate rector of a Ukrainian university that's managed to keep operating throughout the war. So you would have students in the battlefield. Okay? Now, the reason I would like to bring up is the points you made, and they all seem to interconnect with messaging. The messaging that's gone on predominantly, uh, and it started about 10 years ago, Russian messaging to the U.S. has been uh, significantly ramped up since the start of the war, and it's now had effect. The disinformation campaign the propaganda campaign. I mean, it's it's like a fire hose, and everyone uh, doesn't matter what side of Congress you're on. Has been in the media has been drinking out of that fire hose, and so the information right now it's incredibly difficult to ascertain the true dynamics of what is transpiring, what isn't transpiring, the shading of it, and everything else, and not just in Ukraine, but the global impact. How would you see us trying to undermine the Russian propaganda machine, which is highly successful 
in the United States. Okay, one, thank you, great point, and I agree with you. Like the Russians, by the way, they've been doing this since 1917. Yes. Right? Yes. Nothing new here. No, right. We, we, at the end of, we, at the end of the Cold War, allowed our capability to deal with this and understand disinformation and counter to atrophy. Shame on us. Mm -hmm. My answers are one, education. We are not teaching critical thinkers in this country. Yeah. And they're not they're not able to process information, especially in the age of technology where they're being pelted with quick things and they see it. I'll admit, I sit on the metro sometimes and I see some of those TikTok dances and I like, I get bought. It was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> I can't make you laugh, no matter how hard I try. The other thing I would say is, personally, we need to go on the offensive. The Russians are on the offensive. Why do you think Putin did what he did in 2016 in our elections? Why do you think they've been so aggressive, let's say, since 2005, five, six in the information war against the United States? Because he's scared to death of the message. I, like, and when I was in Russia, young Russians especially, they want a piece of this. Why do you think, he's, why do you think he wants Ukraine to fail? Somebody asked me very senior in the government when I was still in government, they said, do you think Putin wants to own Ukraine? I said, no, he doesn't want you to. He doesn't want the Ukrainians to. He wants to spoil it for everybody. Because he's scared to death. That's his buffer. He's scared to death that the Ukrainians are going to be able to elect their own leaders. They're going to be able to deal with corruption. Okay? They're going to be able to have an economy that can trade with the world. And that people are going to be like, oh, that all of a sudden it's going to get back to people in Russia. What... Say one story. In 2017, when the European Union lifted the visa restriction for Ukrainians and they could travel visa free, the Russians were going crazy. The Russians I knew in Moscow were apoplectic. They were saying, How is it that the Ukrainians can do that, but we can't? And you know what a lot of them would say? It's because of the Tsar. It's his fault. In my opinion, we need to go on the offensive. We need to take this fight and keep him off balance. And my frustration is we're not doing it. We have every capability to do it, but we're not doing it. Because it's hard we're, to do it with a psychopath, though. Right. It's not that hard. We Okay, you know what? Things are hard. Let's try and do it. Okay. I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm just saying. It worked in the Cold War. a psychopath, they, they, they morph, you know. Okay, but, but that psychopath is surrounded by people. And eventually those people yeah. are going to see. Like, why are we telling the Russian people what is really going on in your country? The crime statistics. The end. One thing I have not heard, other than the beginning of the war, Arnold Schwarzenegger made a very good video no, Arnold. <laughs> to the Russian people. He said, like, this is not a war against you, but my father was a Nazi, and this is like your, this is how your people are behaving. you got to stop this. We're not messaging that. Ronald Reagan, remember when he got on TV, he had this agreement with Gorbachev, a message to the Russian people, Soviet people? I can tell you that in 2019, Russians were still talking about how much they loved Ronald Reagan. We're not communicating effectively. We're not, I don't see us trying. So I, my argument is let's take the fight to them in the information space. Let's fight their lies with truth. All right? And for the American people, we need to just teach people to be critical thinkers. Okay, I think we're out of time. I'm being told to think that what my, my wife would say. Zip it. <laughs>